Hallo, herzlich willkommen zurück aus der Mittagspause. Ich hoffe, ihr habt euch alle gestärkt und seid jetzt bereit für den letzten Vortragsblock auf der FIFCON 2018. Den Anfang macht Seda Gürses. Seda Gürses ist Informatikerin und sie arbeitet ähm, an der Universität im belgischen Löwen und in Princeton und ähm, forscht zum Thema Privacy unter anderem in sozialen Netzwerken und ähm, wird heute über Pots sprechen und was Pots sind, wird sie euch am besten selber ähm, berichten. Zur Erklärung, ähm, den Einfang, äh, der wird auf Deutsch stattfinden und dann der Einfachheit halber wird der Vortrag auf Englisch weitergehen. Ganz viel Spaß. Ja, und äh, noch eine Änderung. Ähm, ich wollte erstmal so eine kleine Annonce machen. Ähm, wir haben letztens ein kleine, ähm, warte mal, kommt's? Ja, ähm, ein kleines ähm, Protest angefangen, äh, weil es ist mittlerweile sehr üblich in vielen Ländern, dass ähm, Privacy-Konferenzen privaten ähm, Sponsoren haben. Das kennen wir wahrscheinlich auch von Hacker-Konferenzen. Und wir haben irgendwie angefangen mit einem Beispiel, äh, Palantir. Also ich weiß nicht, ob äh, der Firma Palantir euch bekannt ist. Äh, die sind bekannt dafür, dass sie Überwachungssysteme für Polizei und Intelligenz äh, ähm, Behörden entwickeln und sie sind der, einer der Hauptsponsoren ähm, äh, von der Amsterdam Privacy Conference und wir haben die ähm, Organisatoren gebeten, dass sie das ändern. Äh, bisher haben wir keine gute Antwort, ähm, aber wir haben dann überlegt, okay, machen wir einen Prote Protest und wir fangen an ähm, mit Palantir und was das Problem ist mit Palantir, aber sagen wir natürlich genauso gut gibt es Probleme mit Google, Facebook, Amazon, wer auch immer, der dann Sponsor wird von diesen Privacy-Konferenzen äh, und wir müssen eine größere Diskussion darüber haben. Ähm, es wäre gut, ähm, wir haben mittlerweile über 200 Signaturen, ähm, sie, sie sind alle willkommen, <lacht> heute auch das unterzuzeichnen äh, oder einfach die Diskussion auch in Deutschland anzufangen, falls es Sponsoren sponsorierte Konferenzen gibt, auch in Deutschland, die problematische Zusammenstellungen anbieten. Okay, das war jetzt die Werbung. Okay, ähm, jetzt mache ich die offizielle Sache. Okay. Ähm, erstmal so vielen Dank an FIFCON und die Einladung, dass ich hier äh, bekommen habe. Ähm, dieses ich werde noch ein paar Minuten Deutsch sprechen und dann wechsle ich zu, zum Englischen. Ähm, ich verfolge die, die Arbeit von FIF lange Zeit und, und ich bin sehr dankbar für ihre Arbeit, die jetzt, als wir festgestellt haben, seit fast 35 Jahren, noch nicht vielleicht ganz, aber ähm, äh, ich bin meine Arbeit, in meiner Arbeit sehr an der Tradition in Deutschland von Informatik und Gesellschaft äh, dankbar ähm, und es ist sehr schön, dann einige der, der wichtigen Personen in meinem Leben auch in diesem Zimmer sitzen jetzt. Ähm, ich habe mit an der Humboldt-Universität Humboldt Universität mit Heidi Schellover und Wolfgang Keul zusammengearbeitet. Und ich glaube, alles, was ich jetzt mache, wäre unmöglich ohne Ihre ähm, Input in den vergangenen Jahrzehnten. Also nochmals vielen Dank an alle FIF-Leute und auch an Wolfgang, die, ich weiß, gestern einen Preis bekommen hat. <lacht> ja, okay. Ähm, kurz zur Zusammenfassung von dem Vortrag. Äh, ich werde drei Punkte machen. Also ich glaube, ich werde einen Unterschied machen zwischen künstlicher Intelligenz in der Wissenschaft versus künstlicher Intelligenz in dem Markt und in Technologiepolitik. Mein Ansatz für den späteren, also künstliche Intelligenz im Markt und Technologiepolitik, ist, dass es geht darum, dass viele Investitionen in irgendwelche Technologien gemacht werden schon gemacht worden sind. Also es gibt schon ein Angebot, in dem es viele Investitionen gibt. Und ähm, es wird sozusagen versucht, durch die Technologiepolitik einen Bedarf zu schaffen. Das ist sozusagen eine umgekehrte Ökonomie. Ähm, wir hören seit, künstlich, seit 60, 60 Jahren, dass künstliche Intelligenz kommt und die Welt ändert. Aber wir haben das Gefühl, ähm, oder ich habe das Gefühl mindestens, dass eins, was die Technologie, äh, was künstliche Intelligenz bezeichnet als, als Technologie, hat sich komplett geändert. Also es wird immer gesagt, künstliche Intelligenz kommt, aber es ist immer was anderes, was kommt. Ähm, und, ähm, und einfach dazu führt, dass, dass ähm, eine Art von moralische Panik einzuführen, so dass Städte und Institutionen und, und ähm, Staaten noch mehr Geld investieren sollen, so dass diese Investitionen überhaupt ähm, erfolgreich werden. Ähm, und <lacht> Und ich habe auch das Gefühl, dass mit den künstlichen Intelligenzdiskussionen, auch wieder nicht als Wissenschaft, aber als Technologiepolitik, immer von abstrakten 
äh, Sachen, abstrakte Technologien äh, gesprochen wird. Oh, sorry. Ja. Ja, sorry. Ähm, aber ich werde versuchen, heute die Blickwinkel ähm, einfach ein bisschen zu grundieren in dem Software Engineering, äh, Software Entwicklungspraxis. Also ich werde jetzt nicht gucken, was ist künstliche Intelligenz und was sind diese abstrakten Technologien, aber ich werde fragen, wie sieht Softwareentwicklung aus, wie hat sich geändert und wie bringt das uns zu, was jetzt künstliche Intelligenz genannt wird. Ähm, und was ich dann da zeigen werde, äh, ist, dass äh, wir haben mittlerweile sehr datenintensiven Services, also kein Software, die in Packages kommen, aber als Services ähm, angeboten werden, die dann innerhalb der Logik von Optimierung funktionieren. Also Annette hat eigentlich meinen Vortrag geklaut vorhin, aber ich hoffe trotzdem ist das irgendwie lustig, was ich erzähle. Ähm, worum es jetzt geht, ist die Optimierung von alle Umgebungen und Populationen ähm, und ich glaube, da müssen wir sehr viel diskutieren, ähm, aber ich werde mich auf die Externalitäten von Optimierung konzentrieren. Also mein Argument ist, dass jedes optimierte System hat Externalitäten, also Kosten, die mit sich kommen und es geht darum, die Technologiefirmen dazu zu bringen, diese Externalitäten zu internalisieren, also diese Kosten zu innen zu nehmen, aber auch darum, dass wir auch von außen Widerstand leisten können und deswegen POTS. Also die Idee von POTS, also Protective Optimization Technologies, baut sich eigentlich auf die Idee von PETS, Privacy Enhancing Technologies. <lacht> Wir dachten, das ist vielleicht äh, einfach, sich daran zu erinnern. Und es ist immer, <lacht> äh, es ist immer die Idee, sozusagen ähm, Werkzeuge zu entwickeln, die dann äh, Nutzer nicht abhängig machen von den Serviceleister, aber selber sozusagen ihre Privacy schützen können. Wir wissen, dass solche Schutzmechanismen nicht revolutionär sind, aber die sind auf dem Weg dahin hilfreich und wichtig. Das war jetzt die deutsche Zusammenfassung. Now I go to English. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, and I'll try to speak a little slower. Uh, if I speak very fast, you are more than welcome to slow me down. Um, I will not do the thank you again in English. I hope that's going to be okay. And I'll start, start with um, waiting for artificial intelligence is like waiting for Godot. Um, it's about creating a demand for an investment that is in the process of creating an immense supply. Artificial intelligence has been coming for 60 years. However, however, what we refer to artificial intelligence 60 years ago is different from its manifestation today, and probably this will hold for whatever is claimed to be the artificial intelligence in the future. And we have not only been waiting for artificial intelligence. Consortia of tech companies first asked us in the last 20 years to expect things like the Internet of Things. Um, that was in the beginning of the 2000s, for those who are old enough. Um, and it was following the trends in the 90s in research labs like Xerox Park, where people said, we won't get the Internet of Things, but we will get ubiquitous computing. Um, but we, what we instead got, instead of ubiquitous computing, was social networks. First, governments, companies, and journalists alike argued that social networks would re lead to revolutions and bring to us democracy. In the last three years, um, and actually they wouldn't just bring to us democracy in the Western world, but they would also bring democracy in the authoritarian world. Um, now we hear that social networks bring authoritarianism to democracies. So there's an underlying logic to the argument that there's a technology that is unstoppable, it's inevitable, is revolutionary, and we should prepare ourselves for receiving it. First of all, What is expressed as unstoppable technological change is in fact a story about companies already investing in a technology, meaning they're already creating a supply. The objective of waiting for the technology is to create an expe expectation that its arrival is inevitable and its, and its reception, its welcome, a necessary condition for economic and social progress and therewith creating a demand. In the current case of artificial intelligence, the argument is that if your health system, your city, your car, your policing are not smart, they're not made smart with artificial intelligence, you're going to fall behind. Hence, to welcome it, cities, health and educational institutions should demand it and do so without much regulation. So the moral panic that is then surrounding this promised technology, in this case artificial intelligence, is also part of creating a demand. 
So we are told that artificial intelligence will deliver an industrial revolution, a market revolution. However, it may also cause some problems. These include, for example, according to one of the institutions that I'm, qu I'm quoting here, AI Now, um, that we might lose jobs, ha experience bias and exclusion, um, have in infringement upon rights and liberties, and may have problems with safety and in critical infrastructures. This is a short but very worrying list. However, this is a list that creates moral panic. Uh, and what's interesting is that this moral panic is cultivated with industry-funded th think tanks, which have very um, present ties with universities to make them look very neutral, and start from the assumption that these technologies will come, but only with some, effect, some side effects. So they, these, these organizations, these research uh, centers and think tanks, ask us not only to expect these technologies, but to imagine how we will live with them once they arrive, how they should be tweaked to better fit our lives. So it's only about tweaking, but never about questioning whether we should get these technologies or not. I think one of the recent manifestations um, of this approach is an effort to achieve algorithmic fairness. Um, and I can go into that maybe in the discussion because I think it will take too much time right now. Um, but we see in the algorithmic fairness that it's about tweaking algorithms but not actually questioning whether the introduction of some of these systems will cause inequalities which are much grander than what algorithms can do. What is significant in all of these framings of artificial intelligence that's coming is that they allow those engaged in the topic from, they, they allow them not to name any actual actors uh, or engage in the political economy of artificial intelligence. AI is an abstraction, uh, very much like algorithms are abstractions, big data um, and Internet of Things. They're all abstract things and nobody's pushing for them. They just come from open, you know, the skies, they fall upon us. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so um, in this way, artificial intelligence can be talked about and critiqued abstractly in disembodied form, as if the, these technologies um, are neutral and are only colored by the shortcomings of the world around them. This is manifest in statements like, algorithms are not biased, they do not discriminate, but the data sets represent our biases as a society and the algorithms reflect them back to us. Algorithms in that sense are presented in the discussions like mirrors, they're neutral, they just present us to ourselves. It is an accident rather than a condition enabled by the ways in which we produce knowledge and technology. As an alternative to this abstraction and as an alternative to this idea that artificial intelligence is inevitable and it's coming, I want to look at the past. So as an alternative, I propose that we analyze um, software engineering practices and systems development um, that is very much made possible due to very concrete socioeconomic production decisions. So I locate some of the or origins of the current discussion on artificial intelligence in the shift of software engineering from shrink wrap software to, uh, and PCs to services and clouds, which allowed software developers and companies to incorporate real-time feedback from users and the environments in the business and software development process. Okay. Oof, sorry. Um, okay, let's go. So here are the three shifts that we see, at least since the 90s. Uh, if you've been in the computer business since the 60s, you will actually see a pendulum uh, where we used to have mainframes and services. It went to PCs and coming back. But what we see now since the 90s is starting with shrink wrap software, uh, waterfall models, and uh, personal computers to what I would say is services, agile programming, and the cloud. And just so that we can all wake up after lunch, um, I just need to make sure I know that the room is following this. How many of you know what shrink wrap software is? Okay. Um, just to explain, um, how many of you have gone to a shop to buy software in a box? Okay. It came with a plastic wrap around it? Yes? That was the shrink wrap, okay? And when you opened the shrink wrap, you went into a contractual agreement with the software company and accepted that software, even though you hadn't installed it yet. Then you took the diskettes home, you had a personal computer, you installed it, hopefully it all went well, um, and there you go, you had your software and then you started using it. The relationship with the company was mostly at this moment where you opened the box, and afterwards what you did your, with your software was mostly your issue, unless you were pirating and they came after you. How many people know what a waterfall model is? 
Okay, that's a little better. Okay, it's a form of developing software. It, was, it came about in the 60s. Um, if you look at the history of software engineering, there's always a battle between those people who think software engineering is a management issue. They're just breaking down uh, tasks and managing them well, and others who think it's a matter of experts building systems bottom up. And what we've seen in, in change is the waterfall model, which was much more managerial and top-down, being questioned in the last 20 years by agile programming uh, um, developers who proposed a whole host of different methods, which I'm calling agile programming, that would basically put the, to the developers and the users at the center of software development. And finally, with, um, with the shift to services, um, we moved away from having a lot of processing done on our computers to the cloud, and I will talk about all of these in detail. And what I'm going to talk about is not things I just made up. We did an exploratory study uh, where we did interviews and chats with people, read industry white papers, and looked at legal and policy literature to understand how what we call, I mean, these three things we call the agile turn have come to change the environment that we live in um, and have great impact on what happens with privacy, but also what kind of protective technologies are necessary today. Okay, so to give you a feeling of the excitement around shrink wrap software, um, I thought I would show you this clip, and I will ask now somebody in the room to tell me if they know what this is. Yeah. Uh, it, mm, no, somebody else? Why, why are they dancing? Microsoft Four. Four. What? Board. Microsoft? Board. Board. Okay, but what are they celebrating? That's right, Windows, Windows 95 release party. Um, okay, like releasing, releasing software was something that happened every two, three years. Apparently, in Microsoft, literally after the release, everybody would get up and change their position in the, off in the offices in this very large company. Windows 95 was like such a big party, they lit up the Empire State Building in New York. Like, it was a big thing to release software. Um, but what we've seen today with services is that, you know, software developers can release software up to 50 times an hour, a day, whatever, depending on the company. So we can't party as much, uh, so something has changed, right? Um, all right, so coming back to what has changed in these three things, I will start, start with the move from shrink wrap to services. Um, I'm not a historian, but if I kind of did a makeup uh, of history and looked at one or two incidents that provided some insights, there's this one, uh, unclear, some people claim this was a note sent by Bezos to his employees at Amazon 2001 or 2002, we don't know exactly, where he basically said, all the teams will henceforth expose their data and functionality through service interfaces. So he basically turned Amazon's, all of its Amazon's workforce, into, he pushed them into creating APIs for their databases and making their services internally available, but also externally, which, is also, which could also be seen also as the start of the Amazon um, cloud that we know today. Um, and this looks like just a horrible memo to get, especially if point six, anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. Um, but <laughs> if we put that thing aside and look at the transition that it enabled, um, maybe I can give an example that is not very kosher because I'm going to give examples from um, proprietary software again. Um, and the difference that we have seen is from shrink wrap to services. And there are, of course, differences between because there are enterprise and apps as, uh, as something that's between shrink wrap and services. But if we just go to the extremes, like shrink wrap on the one side and services on the other, um, and think about the experience, the difference in the experience between Microsoft Word and Office 365 or Google Docs, um, we see that in the beginning you went to a store, bought your software, um, took out the diskettes or CD-ROM or DVD, depending on how old you are, uh, installed it on your machine. That meant that as a user you were also at maintaining your machine. Um, you hope that the software that you had in the box matched your hardware. This was not a trivial thing and a big headache for developers. Um, user, users had a lot of control. Um, this was seen as a problem for many people, but not for geeks. Um, and you paid in advance, right? And with services, what we have is that we have um, no installation anymore unless, I mean, other than like maybe installing a browser or an app, which is like super oversimplified in comparison to what we have to do. Um, the update and maintenance of the, of the code remains on the developer side because the code remains with the developers. There's no release party where you have to let go of your baby. It actually sticks with you, right? And so that means you can continue to make changes to code 
uh, which means that you can always do apps updates. And with services, what we have also interesting for the users is they don't have as much control. Everything they do can now be datafied. You can basically see where the users are uh, clicking, um, what services they're using, or how they're using the features. Um, but it also allows things like collaboration, right? Like, I mean, many of us have sent Word documents, or you know, if you're using open source alternatives, um, through emails, and then we had all sorts of versioning problems. And this new environment basically allows collaboration to be much more easy. But what also changes is that you pay um, as you use. Um, this is where, of course, the, the term you pay with your data comes in as well. Like we didn't pay with our data when we bought Microsoft uh, Word. Uh, we paid for the license or we got it uh, an illegal copy. Um, but now you can basically, if you're especially a company, you can pay as you use or you can even try software out before moving your whole enterprise. So it's a very big shift both for the users and the developers. Um, so if we look at what this whole shift means, um, is that we have now a server, often thin client model. Um, that means that the transaction, which was only at the moment of purchasing your shrink wrap um, software, is now throughout your use. So you're constantly in transaction with the company. Um, we have bundled services. I will explain that in a moment a little bit more. And we have licensing and pricing models that are basically based on use, um, which also means that there's intensified tracking to know who's using what and how you're going to license them and how you're going to make them pay. Um, and this one is especially important because often we talk about tracking as being a problem of the advertisement world, but we don't talk about it also as being part of the service architectures and licensing. Okay, so these are like important little details here. So if you would come with my abstract representation of what happened, in the past we had something like the shrink wrap software production, then there was a release party, Empire State Building is lit, lit up, uh, the boxes go into the shops, and then you purchase as a user, and then you use. So there were two different phases, production and use. Okay? What, what happens with the services is that you start producing the software, um, and you don't uh, produce everything yourself. You integrate a bunch of services that have already existed somewhere. So maybe Amazon has services that you can use. Um, and then the user starts using your service, and they're in this pay-per-use model, so the transaction is ongoing. As you use, you're paying for the software. Um, and you're basically now within the production. Um, the production and the consumption phases are now collapsed. So there's no separate production from use. Everything you use is integrated into how this software gets produced. And we'll talk about that some more. So this is kind of the um, implication of this. And I'm sorry, if you're a software developer, all of this is known to you. But it's going to make sense why I'm telling you all of this in a moment. So let's say that you want to go to a website, which is there to create pictures. Um, so, and then this website maybe has like some specific application um, features for uploading photos and, I don't know, filters and stuff like this, but they don't want to develop all these other things, like advertisement to get some funds, authentication into the website. Maybe you want to be able to make some payments, and you can integrate uh, a service that allows you to do payments. Maybe you want maps so that people can locate their pictures, a social network for discussion, etc. So basically, the service provider will integrate all of these services in order to give you the website. For the user, it looks like they're interacting with one party, but in fact, they're interacting with a couple um, hundreds sometimes, <laughs> which they don't always know. And what's also interesting is that this service model also applies to the developers. So the developers also use services to develop software themselves. So anywhere from um, you know, team integration tools um, to data brokers to get data about your users or analytics like Google Analytics to test your features or for A-B testing, I'll give an example there. Um, you basically use a bunch of other services to even develop the, ser the service itself. So these are not even always visible to the users. So here's an example. So Full Story was a service that serv uh, websites could integrate. So if I would be the service that's giving you the picture album, I could put on Full Story. I could integrate it with their API. And it would give, give me a complete replay of the user's interactions in video form. Right? So all of you, <laughs> so it's not just your clicks, but basically I could rewatch how you moved around the website, which services you use, what things you, you typed into the boxes that were in the forms, et cetera. Um, and we found that in the top 1 million sites, we already had quite a few uh, of the websites using the service. And later on, colleagues at Princeton wrote out about how they could actually see people's login credentials and private information using Full Story, right? And so this is the kind of thing where a developer is probably uh, integrating Full Story to see if the users have problems with their services so that they can see where do they struggle with um, certain kind of interface elements. Um, but it actually ends up being like a privacy nightmare. 
um, and it becomes very difficult to make this kind of thing visible to users. Okay, but that's not where I want to go. I want to go somewhere else. So let's quickly talk about the uh, move from waterfall to agile programming. And if you believe in one of these things, and I'm going to do a bad job in explaining your color of agile development, I'm very, very sorry. I'm just giving like a very um, broad overview, and I'm happy to be corrected later. Um, and so here's like a quick, again, like pseudo history, uh, where things have gone. Um, and for those who don't know, the waterfall model was basically about these discrete phases that you could go down. So you would start with the company handing your requirements and analysis and specification. Uh, for those who don't know, I was trained as a requirements engineer. Uh, this job is practically gone now, so it's kind of <laughs> weird to be still in academia, but it's nice. Um, so basically, people like me would go into the companies to understand what the requirements were of the system or go to the environment where a system is going to be introduced. Um, and then the requirements would be turned into a specification, so you go back to your office, then you do the architectural design, and then you start implementing and integrating. Um, two, three years later, um, you come out, you go back to the company, or whoever ordered the software, you start doing um, some verification testing to see that what you produce has anything to do with what the, what the company or the organization wanted, um, and then you go into the mode of operation and maintenance. Now, it turned out that um, with this model, something like 64% of the projects, I think, um, failed. Um, failed meant that they either failed completely or they failed in terms of cost, so they cost much, much more than was promised, or they took much, much longer to develop. Okay? So this model was not really working, especially economically speaking, and I think economics is really important here um, throughout the talk. It also turns out that 60% um, of software costs is due to maintenance, and of that 60% is adding new functionality to legacy software. So you can imagine that when service architectures came and the code could remain on the side of the developers, the companies that were losing so much money and basically bleeding with these waterfall models were very happy. Um, and so were the developers who look like this. Okay, um, this is uh, from the Agile Manifesto website, um, which tells you a lot about the diversity of the group as well. Um, <laughs> And here's basically, um, in a very quick and unfair manner, uh, the main principles. So what you need to um, centralize is um, individuals and interactions over process and tools. Um, so it's very interesting what gets left out and how that actually impacts us today, like the process is gone. Uh, what we believe in is working software versus comprehensive documentation. And if you think about the GDPR, that's a general data protection law. Um, that has a lot about documentation. You see where there's a conflict. Um, it's very much about, we value customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So there goes the requirements document. Um, and they're responding to change rather than following a plan. Um, the, there were, I think there's a talk with like 99 different agile methods. So you can go and find that online. There are many, many more probably by now since that talk. Here's another version. I like to show this because it tells, uh, says a lot about getting things even faster. Um, I should go slower. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> How much time do I have? Just so that. Oh, okay. Um, okay. What's important about extreme programming is that it's very interested in testing all the time. And I want you to think about this uh, focus on testing and A-B testing, which we'll come back to later. Okay, so what happens with the move to agile development methods is that testing becomes very, very cent central, and so does user centricity or client centricity most of the times. Um, and because we have services and we can constantly collect data about how features are being used, we can also do all sorts of testing using that data, right? Like, so it's no longer just testing the correctness of software, but testing the interactions. The development is supposed to be in short iterations, so you don't say, I'm going to develop a photo album service, but you say, I'm going to develop a service, we'll start with the uploading, and then you go feature by feature what you're going to do, and every step you iterate and you test to see how the users are reacting. Um, and the other thing is simplicity, so what you want is reuse and modularity, which means that you try to break things down as much as possible. Okay, um, so what we start getting as a result of all of these developments um, is what I can call feature-based optimization. And I'll cut this a bit short um, because of time, but what we start seeing is that if software development was a cost issue, 
with services and with the kind of data we can collect, it becomes completely put under the logic of optimization. So when Aneta was talking about you know, people who are working being put under the logic of optimization or municipalities or health systems, I would say also software developers are put under the logic of optimization and all the resources they use as well. And that becomes possible because we have services and because we have agile methods. Okay, I'm gonna skip all this. Maybe this is um, kind of important. Um, with services, um, you can capture the behavior of the users. So you can constantly look to see, how can I tweak my features to know which of the features will give me what I want to um, earn money on, right? Like, so we can economically optimize while we're optimizing, for example, for clicks. Um, but the tracking that is in services is not limited to tracking the users. For example, if you're going to integrate a lot of services into your website, then you need to also track those services. You need to know that they're all functioning the way they should be because you're dependent on external parties for your service to run. Uh, and you can imagine they're dependent on external parties. So there's a lot of tracking going on to make sure that your service ecosystem is functioning. Um, and then you want to make sure that whatever tracking you're doing is really tracking everything it should be tracking. So <laughs> there are literally layers and layers of meta tracking to see how many resources you're using, which services are doing, they're doing the thing they should be doing, and user tracking, and then license tracking. So we're seeing a whole um, sort of ecosystem of tracking and optimization that's going on. Okay. So what's the issue with this? It seems like an efficient way uh, to do software. Um, and without going into these details, I'm going to say is that what is at stake is that all of a sudden, all of our lives are put under the logic of optimization, right? All of the social activities that are um, touched with services um, is put under the logic of optimization. Um, and it's kind of interesting to think about uh, what it means to put all sorts of um, social things into uh, a, a logic of um, logistics and control, like systems control. Um, and also how politically often what we get is because it's optimal, we should desire these systems, right? So there's a lot happening there um, with the switch from information systems to optimization systems. So if, if I would try to give you an overview of what has changed, so not just about we went from shrink wrap to services and software engineering has changed, but qualitatively, the, the, the systems have changed that we look at today. So whereas information systems are focused on storage, processing, transport of information, and organizing knowledge, so they're still about knowing knowledge and reasoning, optimization systems are not about knowing at all. Um, they basically n leverage the data that they gather to not only understand the world, so they're not about gathering information and reasoning about the world, but optimizing it. Um, so, optimization systems seek to extract economic value through the capture and manipulation of people's activities and environments, right? So, all of these services constantly capture our activities, they capture information about our environments. They don't care to know, they care to manipulate them in order for um, improving their economic income. Um, so, optimization systems in comparison to information systems treat the world not as a static place to be known, but one to sense and co-create. Okay, so this is very, very different kind of systems. Uh, and the kind of problems that we can see with optimization systems have been on the headlines and they've been spoken about by um, academics and activists for a long time. Social sorting, I mean, we hear a lot about algorithmic discrimination, but originally, um, Academics started talking about this problem in the 90s. Mass manipulation, we hear about Cambridge Analytica and elections. Asymmetrical concentration of powers, we have the GAFAM, Google, Apple, Facebook, um, Amazon, and Microsoft. Um, absolutely majority dominance, where minority users get hunted down almost, and there's very little done um, unless it is algorithmically or optimally doable to protect the minorities, etc. So these are the ways we talk about these things in general. But what if we go back to software engineering and talk about them in terms of optimization? So if we think that software engineering has become data-centric and it functions under the logic of optimization, what can we say about these things in terms of optimization systems? So we argue that optimization systems come with externalities. There is no optimization system 
without these problems. Okay? It's not like if you would do a good goal, if you had a good optimization goal, we wouldn't have these problems. No. Optimization systems come with these externalities. This is not a complete list, um, but here's the start. So they disregard non-users. For sure, uh, I'll give examples. They disregard environments that they function in. They make use of them. Aneta was talking about this, uh, where health uh, industry is being seen as a market and making use of this infrastructure that has been developed with taxpayer money. Um, they typically benefit a few. I mean, it's an optimization curve, and some people are optimal and some people are not. Um, they have to explore the world, um, so that means that they have to sometimes try new things out and they can abuse users to f explore things and the, the risks associated or the costs associated with that exploration falls on the shoulders of the risk, etc. The list is long, um, but I'll just go into an example in location-based services. Um, so I'm going to specifically focus on an app called Waze. I don't know how many people use Waze here. And who, who drives? <laughs> right? Like, I don't know, maybe, maybe you drive, I don't. Um, but many people use um, uh, ways to reroute around traffic. So it's basically like Google Maps. I mean, the company is also owned by Google, um, but it doesn't just tell you how to get from A to B, but it tells you how to get, get there in the fastest way possible. So Waze is symbolic of how location-based services have changed with the move to services. Um, so location services no longer just track and profile individuals to generate spatial intelligence, but they now leverage this information to manipulate users' behavior and create ideal geographies that optimize space and time to their investors' interests. So part and uh, parcel of this um, development are population experiments using techniques like A-B testing that drive iterative designs that ensure sufficient gain for most users while maximizing profits. Waze reroutes its users even when there is congestion on a given path, allowing these users to act with perfect selfishness, which is also the title of this newspaper article. Um, it turns out that in a happy, I mean, it turns out that actually what, uh, okay, rewind. So in some happy universe, if everybody could get as fast as possible from A to B, you would think this is a good thing. But it turns out, um, researchers from Berkeley showed, that traffic beezing apps might work for the individual, but they do so at the cost of making congestion worse overall. Um, Waze also often redirects users off the, um, off the highways through suburban neighborhoods that cannot sustain heavy traffic. So while it's useful for drivers, it affects neighborhoods by making streets busy, noisy, and less safe. Consequently, towns may need to fix and police roads more often, um, and with such systems, even when some users benefit, non-users and the environments they inhabit may bear the ill effects of optimization. Uh, so this is again to underline the point that um, actually the, the traffic um, engineers that looked at this sh show that if only a few users are using ways, they do get from A to B faster, but if everybody starts using ways, there's just chaos. Okay, so this is... Um, <laughs> A nice one. Okay, so what, what are we proposing? So optimization systems have these externalities, and we have many, many reports um, that the companies do not react when people say, look, my neighborhood is destroyed because Waze is rerouting this traffic. And Aneta had a lot of examples of workers um, you know, getting weird messaging from their bosses because they took pauses, etc. So there are all these externalities, and the companies will not take them seriously. So could we maybe do something else? And we decided to be inspired by the users of these systems for exploring new ways to deal with these things. Um, namely, we found out that people who live in these suburban areas that don't want the waste traffic will start reporting roadblocks on their streets so that ways will reroute to another route. And they won't. <laughs> okay. All right. So here are some examples. Um, so in one of them, um, somebody did a virtual roadblock. Apparently, even the police have a problem because people can uh, log, for example, whether there's like uh, police controls and speed limits, etc. Um, so they started overpopulating ways so that people don't have the correct information. Uh, and there were some researchers in Israel that created a bunch of ghost accounts and managed to make it look like there is a lot of traffic on a freeway, got all the cars rerouted, and then had the freeway to themselves. Um, <laughs> okay, so our idea is that we want to be inspired by how these users have been looking at manipulating optimization systems to re-optimize themselves and the environments that they live in, and we want to design tools that actually are effective and allow them to do so in a, in a much more successful way. Um, 
And basically, in computer science terms, what we're saying is optimization systems are machine learning systems at this point. So what we can do is use adversarial machine learning uh, to re-optimize the conditions of the users in their environments when they're hit hard by optimization systems. Um, I'm almost done with my time. Uh, we have a whole paper on uh, what we mean by pots and how to develop them. But basically, we propose that you think of a benefit function, so let's say ways has a benefit function for all the people, including non-users in the environment, and the people who benefit the most are on the, on the top hill, so they're happy puppies. And then the ones who are like messed up are when you know, cars start flying into their yards because it's a road that shouldn't have that much traffic, so they're the ones that are not getting a very big benefit. And we think about what kind of inputs we can do to change this curve, the outcome of this optimization system. And the question is, what should it be changed to? And there we have different strategies. So you can correct the imbalances. You can do a protest by basically um, changing the conditions for the the drivers that benefit the most from ways so that they don't benefit, like they keep on being put into traffic, or you can just completely sabotage the system. So we think we can work on these different strategies. And really, Waze is not the only place this happens. For example, Pokemon Go. I don't know, any fans here of Pokemon Go? No fans of Pokemon Go? Jesus. OK, all right. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you're into collecting Pokemons, it turns out that if you're in a very poor neighborhood, if you're in rural areas, you're not going to get a lot of Pokemons. So what the users have been doing is spoofing their GPS. So they go to like main cities. Um, this is, the next one is a bit sad. They changed the, um, the map indicators in OpenStreetMaps to make it look like there are park paths and water sources, because apparently Pokemon Go will spawn mo more Pokemons if they see those things. Um, Uber drivers have been known to turn off their apps when a big event is happening so that they can induce search prices so that they can be paid well. Um, and what we've been doing is um, looking at credit scoring outcomes. So could you change, for example, the amount of money you ask for? Um, and um, I don't know, we changed a couple more things so that you, you're more likely to get a credit from, from the bank. And this one I added as well. This is uh, for insurance companies if they require to wear a Fitbit, then you can put it on a metronome and look like you're exercising a lot. Um, but that's not one of the things we've done. So, all right. Um, there are ethical issues, but I think I'm out of time. You can read our POTS paper here, and I hope this was helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ähm, vielen Dank. Ich bin mir sehr sicher, dass da zu viele Fragen sind, denn gerade den ethischen Teil, der jetzt am Ende kam, den können wir auch noch mal im Plenum <lacht> diskutieren. Hat jemand Fragen? Die Fragen können auch auf Deutsch gestellt werden. Ne? Das ist in Ordnung. Hier vorne ist gleich eine. Ja, vielen Dank für deinen Vortrag. Was mir jetzt als, als erstes im Kopf hängen bleibt, ist die Idee von, von Datensabotage. <lacht> Was ähm, stellst du dir darunter vor, welche Perspektiven gibt es da oder vielleicht auch welche Fallstricke? Ähm, Datensabotage wäre, wenn die Optimierungssystem sozusagen keine... Ähm, ähm, It, it creates uncertainty. I'm so sorry, I can't do this in, in, in German. Uh, it's basically if optimization has some predictive value. Um, I mean, if, if you think that if, I, if Waze tells me that I should go this way, I think it's going to work. But all of a sudden, I notice that Waze keeps on sending me the wrong way and I'm in more traffic. Eventually, I'll turn it off. So it's those kind of strategies where basically the optimization function doesn't function anymore at all. So that, that would be one strategy. But we're welcoming everyone to think with us on how to sabotage these systems. Uh, ah, the drawbacks. OK, sure, yes. So maybe uh, this is a good way to introduce my slide that I skipped. Uh, so basically, uh, the systems we're proposing is a very much in continuation with obfuscation. Uh, so obfuscation has been proposed for protecting privacy, especially in the case of services. So the idea is that, you know, worries with typically pets, you try to keep your data confidential. Some services, you have to give them some data in order to gather some protection, right? And the typical example um, from Helen Nissenbaum's uh, team was in uh, query obfuscation. So you cannot not give your data to a search engine, you need to give them at least your query, but maybe you can give hundreds of queries, one of which is your real query, and the others are basically noise, right? Um, it's a bigger discussion if this works and how this works, how to make it mathematically rigorous, et cetera. 
We're not interested in, um, in privacy, we're interested in re-optimizing, so it's a different goal. Um, but the technique is very similar, we're using obfuscation. And Brunton and Nissenbaum wrote a book on obfuscation and they said, these are the four ethical considerations we may have. The users are being dishonest, they're polluting the databases, um, they're causing costs for service providers, and they're potentially causing costs for other users and environments. Now, um, uh, what we call, what, what typically could be called dishonesty is we say that the users are giving unsolicited feedback on the externalities of these systems because the companies usually do not want to know about the externalities. That's why they develop these systems, to put the risks of these systems onto the users. That's what they do, that's how they earn money, right? Um, and so the dishonesty claim is not really appropriate here because they're also not interested in knowing things, they just are optimizing, right? And this is why Annette was talking about some workers getting unreasonable paths and noticing they don't work, but it would take them more time to not go down that path um, than to and complain to the company, so they just go down the path anyways, right? Like these systems don't care about who you are and what you do, they care about optimizing. And the reason I say that is like, you know, by now, um, I think something like what I read recently is if you are likely to store people's names with their first name and last name in your phone, it turns out that you're more likely to pay your loans back. Okay, <laughs> right? and honestly, like, that's not knowing something about me. That's using some attribute to optimize a system. So these are like the examples of this is not about knowing, so there can't be an issue about dishonesty. The polluting databases um, could be an issue, but as I said, this is unsolicited feedback, so some, it's kind of giving feedback about externalities. The cost for service providers, well, and for users and environments, the same thing happens in the sense of these services are able to exist because they cost others something. So if there's some more cost to them, then in a sense you're kind of internalizing um, some of the externalities. Now, one of the things that we do say in our papers is that more optimization cannot solve optimization's problems. Okay, this is like an absolute um, limitation of POTS, um, because everything that I said is an externality of an optimization system is also an externality of a POTS right, because it will benefit some users, it will not benefit other users, it will be bad for some environments, etc. However, we know, for example, from search engine optimization that there were always companies that had enough money to re-optimize themselves in search engines, and most of the time, the normal people don't have these kind of resources, and we think that computer scientists should work on making those resources available to others. Does that...? Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I did not realize that there were uh, companies out there that were actually replaying what people are doing with their websites. <laughs> um, I find this um, ethically so um, absolutely problematical. Are you aware of any sites that actually let you know that they do this? Or is it all hidden in the 27 tracking uh, things that they have on their websites? So what happens with service ecosystems, I'm just going to answer your question more generally, and if you want to read about the specific case, then I uh, advise you to look at the Princeton write-up um, on that I had somewhere here. Uh, I'll go back to it in a moment. Here, down. Yeah, Freedom to Tinker has, um, I think, a couple of blog posts on this. Um, basically, when, as a website, uh, I integrate services, I integrate, let's say, 12 services. Right? But those services also integrate each of them, 12 services or whatever. You can just imagine that it just grows exponentially. And the websites themselves lose track of all of the people, all of the parties that they have integrated. So now there are services that will help you track what's being served on your website. I think that's your answer. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, so much good food for thought. Um, one question I have is, I suppose, from the enterprise side. Have you seen any examples where um, enterprises have tried to show some self-restraint or have attempted, um, I guess, to I don't know, meet users halfway in mm -hmm. terms of um, re-optimization? And if so, what are they, and do you think they were valuable? 
I mean, I think um, I'm not sure that um, enough companies see themselves as having externalities, right? Like they don't even notice that they have this thing. We're trying to create a language, so that's the first thing. I think one could argue um, that, for example, the whole fake, fake news discussion, the whole um, you know abuse on platforms, um, unfortunately, like it spills on very quickly into like terrorist content and stuff. Um, are basically consequences of using optimization to, you know, massively distribute information without any quality controls, right? Like, because the obje objective is to disseminate and get as much clicks as, ma as fast as possible. So these things become massive problems. And what we see from these companies is that they, the only proposals they come up with is to use more optimization to solve these problems, right? Like, they'll say, we're developing algorithms that remove unwanted content as fast as possible. And that's what, what I was saying with you can't solve optimizations problems with more optimization. They basically then start having other externalities where they start deleting in an automate, um, automated fashion um, content for minorities, right? Because they look unlike the safe stuff and then they all of a sudden get removed. So if you're from a minority community, then you will also be banned from websites. So I think there's, um, there needs to be a push to, I think, rethink the governance structures of these companies and not to easily accept saying, oh, I'll build an algorithm that will remove fake news and then we'll be fine because that means we'll, we're still in the logic of optimization. You, you still have a question? Do you want to? Thank you. Um, I was thinking that companies also exist in an environment in which there are other parties um, apart from society in general and the end users and one of them would be for example the people who fund and I, we've seen um, in some countries a move to making investment ethical um, is there room for let's say ethical venture capitalism funding that could be a way to attack this issue um, I think right now we need all sorts of mechanisms to tackle the, the issue, but I think what we need first of all is to accept that it is an issue. Uh, and, and I think what I, what I see, for example, um, in the field of algorithmic discrimination, because I know that field a little bit, and I can't go into it very much, but if you can see how companies are very excited about the idea that all the discrimination that systems can cause can be just kind of waved away by saying we tweak the algorithms so that they don't, like, they don't distribute the errors to minorities and then we're done. You see this kind of like um, checkboxing or doing things very easily that are actually very difficult um, and more complicated than the companies make them out to be. So I do think that investor uh, consciousness would be very good and important, but I think we need to think about, you know, well, how do you make laws? How do you make, for example, cities aware that I mean, they know, but that their infrastructure is being used and costs are being externalized. How can they take back um, their cities or how they can internalize these costs, etc.? So, yes, ethical investment may help. And I think, for example, in the case of Uber, um, I mean, they were potifying the world. <laughs> but like in the case of Uber, the investor said, you know, something has to change with this company. Um, but I'm not sure that stopped Uber from, for example, um, paying their workers really badly, right? Like, so, uh, yeah, there's some limitations. Wir haben Zeit für eine letzte Frage. Somebody, somebody. Ähm, kannst du noch mal kurz was dazu sagen, warum du das gerade am agilen Programmieren, also am agilen Programmieren festmachst? Weil ich kann mir vorstellen, dass man agiles Programmieren ja auch unabhängig von Services machen kann und dass man, um mhm. einen Service zu verändern, nicht unbedingt agil programmieren muss, weil man ja nur, die, nur die, die Datenstrukturen verändern muss oder die Datenflüsse verändern muss. Also diesen Connex habe ich nicht, oder vielleicht kannst du da noch mal was dazu sagen, warum ihr sozusagen das festmacht, dass du sagen, das eine zum anderen führt. Also ist die Frage, können wir eine andere Welt vorstellen, wo das agiles Programmieren gut benutzt werden kann, ohne diese Optimierung und Services? Oder fragst du mich, ähm, ob es diese Praxis gibt? Also kannst du... Naja, nee, diese, ähm, die später beschriebenen Zusammenhänge mit Ways, die, die werden ja auch ja, in anderen Zusammenhängen mhm. beschrieben, sozusagen. Warum mhm. du sozusagen das auf, auf das agile Programmieren zurückführst? Um, ich versuche es auf, ich tue es auf Englisch, Entschuldigung. Yes, okay. um, so, what I didn't talk about is also the whole um, economics of companies, and I don't think there has been enough written on this, and I hope people will write, is where the features are used not only to improve the service, 
but for the company to expand its business model, right? Um, so, and so this means that this kind of iterative design, uh, feature-oriented design and testing becomes like a fundamental part of companies collecting data to see if they can maybe move to a new market. Um, so one of the things we notice, for example, is that Waze um, patents include information about the, the user's income, if they bought a house recently and how much the loans were. And so you can imagine that Waze is collecting this data not only because it optimizes the path from A to B, uh, but also because they can pivot the company into something that does something with um, um, property and prices and cities and where to build roads and shops and things like that. So the agility, I think, is an important part there to constantly um, create uh, minimum viable products and change them depending on the economic model of the company. Does that make sense? Yeah. We can discuss longer, but I, I mean, I think if you're asking, like, can we imagine another world in which Agile can be not just, like, about increasing the bottom line of the company, but something else? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, but I do think there are some problems, like A-B testing and population-wide exp experiments, I think, are unacceptable, right? Like, and so the question is, what are we exactly uncoupling from Agile? And that's a longer conversation. Okay, dann ganz herzlichen Dank. Thank you so much again for your talk.